Welcome to the Jenkins Platform Special Interest Group. It's the 30th of July. Uh, remind everyone that we are we abide by the Jenkins Code of Conduct in our meetings. So be nice to each other. So today's act, items that I've got, op, oops, open action items. Open action items here. Java 11 as default in all our images, pending Docker changes. And that's it. Aditya, is there anything that you would like to add to the agenda? Uh, no, no. Okay. All right. So first action item for me is that I'm going to open the Jenkins enhancement proposal today. Uh, it's been, this document has been out for review for an extended period. It's still got a lot of things uh, that I need to, I need to add. Oh, I've got an open question from Tim Jacome. That's good. So um, uh, that we can, we can address there. Then we've got an additional JEP, which won't happen as today that's proposing Docker operating system support pattern. And, but we've already got it started thanks to one of the users who started using the, the technique. Uh, we've also got plugin install manager docs and the PR that's pending to replace install plugins.sh content with our, our Java program. Any questions on the action items? No. Okay, so then the next piece of the story is Java 11 as default in all of our images. And, and that's the Jenkins enhancement proposal that is this thing right here. So, so this will be submitted later today as a pull request to the Jenkins enhancement proposal uh, GitHub repository and we'll start the review and discussion process. And okay. Let's see, any, any questions there? Um, yes, so uh, let's just say that, okay, everyone gives a thumbs up and plus one to, okay, now we are going to have this. So what is the process and how will uh, all the Jenkins images will start using JDK 11? So will it be like uh, a new update is available and then everyone will download that update and use it? So how, how does the process, uh, Basically, what is the flow of the whole thing? Very, very good. So, <clears throat> so the, the proposal is first we will, so the images that are changing as those images which do not include a JDK explicitly in their image tag. So for example, um, 2.301 Alpine if, if the new version, and now let's say we're, we're, we will release next week 305 and then 306, so this number should actually probably be 307. So 2.307, the previous week, 2.306 will deliver JDK 8 inside the Docker image. The, then when we okay. deliver 2.307, we will deliver JDK 11 inside the Docker image instead of JDK 8. And the idea is that two to four weeks, two weeks, two weeks before, the LTS release, so mid-August, we will make the change in weekly. We'll watch it for two weeks and then we'll make the change just before LTS so that the LTS release August 25 has Java 11 in its base images. And, and this now I need to change from the 289 to 2.302, like that. Okay. So Aditya, did that answer your question? Is that we will transition, we will begin the transition in weeklies mid-August, and we will then complete the transition end of August with the, the next long-term support release 2.301.2. Yes, yes, it does answer my question. This is what I was looking for. Uh, so I had a follow-up question. Uh, so from the user's point of view, uh, it's just that it got a new update. So they don't need not worry about the rest of the things. But there might be a case where some uh, some functionality might break, right? So if some software does not support JDK 11, so how are those cases being handled? Exactly. You, you got it. That to a user, when they transition from 2.289.3, to 2.302.1, 2 
they will also implicitly transition from Java 8 to Java 11, running their controller. Now, right. that, that may surprise them. That's why we're going to communicate it. We're going to blog about it. We're going to inform them because those, those changes, it's important that they know this is happening. And even with all of our communication, we still expect there will be people who will be dismayed or say, oh, I need, I need Java 8 for this specific reason. And so one of the proposals here is that we will add image tags for Java 8. So that if a user says, oh, I cannot upgrade to Java 11, they will have a place that they could change their Docker file or change their Docker image they're using to instead use a, use a different image. So they could use latest-JDK8 or LTS-JDK8. Uh, that's amazing. Yes, that answers my question. Okay. Thank you. Now there's a good question here from Tim Jacome. He asked, should we retire the CentOS images? And it's a valid one because CentOS 8 is no longer maintained in the way that it was maintained previously. CentOS 8 has become an a very different distribution and updates are no longer arriving to CentOS 8 in the same way they did before. Therefore, it's becoming out of date. And as it becomes out of date, that's a risk to our users. So Tim's question about should we retire the, the, those images is a very good question. And I'll, I'll be addressing that because I think he's right. We should acknowledge that we're going to retire it and we're going to switch to using a thing based on a, a Linux distribution called Alma Linux, which is a, an open source or a community inspired distribution based on the same concepts that CentOS used to use. Okay. So does does that does that does that address your question? Y yes, it does. Great. All right. Hi, Damien. Oh, is Damien here with us? Yes. Yes. Oh, very good, Damien. We're going to have you describe. That's excellent. We're just about to get to your topic. Okay. Sorry for being late. I I mixed up my time zones. I took it was one hour later. My apologies. It's, it's wonderful that you're here. Thank you very much. You couldn't have better timed it. All right. So no I was just describing the Java 11 transition that we're going to be doing. And it's described in this draft um, Jenkins enhancement proposal that I'll be submitting today. So Damien, I'll rely on you and others as part of the review team to look at this thing next week. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll have discussions about it, I'm sure. Tim Jacome today has provided some good feedback. I've got some things that I need to tune in it before I submit it as a pull request. So it's, it's an attempt to describe what we should do and, and then we'll, we'll plan to implement it over the course of the next few weeks. Okay. All right, so so that really covers it. So the next is pending Docker changes. So Damien, if you'd be willing to to share with us what's happening mm -hmm. in in Docker changes, and I'm going to just mute myself and type. Okay. Um, so we did two main changes in the build process. Uh, the first one is regarding the build step. So we have a build process which is quite straightforward. Um, if a contributor open a pull request on the Docker repository, Jenkins CI slash Docker, then there is a pipeline executed on ci.jenkins.io, which first builds and then tests all the image declination, both Linux and Windows, all on Intel as for today. The build part was a shell script. It was iterating through a list of images and building them. And then the test part, is using bats, so I will go back on that one and iterate over the same list and run the, te run the test harness on each one. That was before our changes. So the first step is most of the work uh, on the build part has been done by team while I worked on the test part. We split the, let's say the major person and we use each other knowledge for reviewing. So always two persons and the knowledge is shared and not only one person. And we had a bunch of review from Mark from uh, Alex Hurl and from Olivier at least. So 
build part, uh, what Tim did was using Docker buildix uh, extension, especially the new command, which is uh, still quite on the edge, the command buildix bake. So first, what is buildix? Buildix is a plugin distributed on most of the recent Docker engine distribution on the CE on both Linux, Windows, and macOS. If you have an earlier version of Docker, or if you don't see buildix enabled on the Docker info on your Docker engine, it means you need to manually install the plugin. And the plugin is a single binary to install on the client side. So there is no change on a remote Docker machine. You don't need to restart Docker. It's only a client side plugin. That plugin as underlined on the official Docker documentation is a new implementation on the way that Docker build commands are implemented. Uh, initially, it featured a better cache implementation, which means faster cache and faster builds, but it also provide additional new features that should solve some of the old problem that Docker had. So here we use buildix, not only for the improvement in performances, that was just switching to buildix without changing anything else was already 10% faster for us in the CI process. But we use docker buildix bake, which will read the manifest file that can be written in JSON as a docker compose YAML or the, ch the, the choice we made with HCL, the HashiCorp uh, DSL language used for Terraform and Packer now. So you can find at the root of on the repository a new file named docker build, uh, no, docker-bake.hcl. Uh, why did we choose uh, HCL over JSON or YAML? JSON does not allow command, uh, commands, so let's forget about JSON. And YAML has its own quirks, and given the, let's say, the heated discussion that can be uh, over YAML, we decided to not go that way. Uh, Personally, I don't really care. Uh, YAML allows commands, but HCL allows something really powerful, variable injection without templating. So HCL seems a first class choice, especially when we have a bunch of images like uh, on our repository. It's a mono repository that generate a collection of images. So by using HCL format, it was, it's easier for us to inject a single tag and have integrated variable uh, management inside the file. So what is the goal of that file? The goal of that file is to be a manifest, a recipe that lists exhaustively all the images we expect to build on that repository on a single place, which is Docker understandable. It only depends on Docker and Docker is the only actor that should be able to read that one. It allows us to specify all the build argument that we usually have on the shell script. So Docker build allows to pass build arguments to the build that can be used then as variable inside the Docker files. We, it allows to specify the lo Docker file location. For instance, you have dockerfile.windows for the Maven image or something. When you have a bunch of Docker file on different directories, you can have one on three that, that uh, point directly. And finally, you can add multiple name for a given image, which means if you build the Docker file, which is on uh, the directory hate slash Debian, then you can specify that the image build there will have different aliases. It will be Jenkins slash Jenkins column LTS GDK hate, and it will also be Jenkins slash Jenkins column Debian dash LTS, etc. You can add as much aliases you want if you want to to have different naming conventions, especially in our case where we have different dimensions, the operating system used as base OS, eventually the architecture, the GDK, and the main line of Jenkins, weekly, LTS, latest, etc. So it allows us to, to put the naming matrix in an exhaustive uh, and declarative way. So as, uh, as we saw during the publish, we forgot the tag during the change. It was easy. It was one tag to add on a collection, and that's all. And we just run the build again instead of a bunch of shell file with iterating over loops and another part of the list and iteration on the Jenkins file, etc. So the goal is to have something that is portable and repeatable. So Tim 
changed all the build process. We are still using some shell scripts, um, but the goal is to have the, as much information as possible on the Docker bake, and the rest is only calling the Docker build X bake command that will parse the file, and based on the entry parameter, we'll select either all the images or just a group of images. The group are internal. We can do whatever group we want. It's only a matter of adding a group inside a file. Or we can target only a specific image and filter out. So that's that's the main work. The, the good positive effect of using that is that it accelerated even more the build. Because when you run Docker build X bake, Docker by default will try to parallelize every images. So whatever list of images you ask him to build, it will analyze and parse the Docker file, the multi-stage Docker file, see if there are images depending on each other, and it will create a tree, and then it will try to build in parallel. So while it's pulling an image, it can already run a run layer. So the efficiency of building with build X bake is really impressive. We were able to put down the build of all images on the same machine size from twice to five, depending on the machine power. So five times faster on the best cases. So the two times faster was on our CI machines and the five times faster was on a team and high uh, machines. So team has a Mac M1 machine and I have a MacBook Pro i hunt. And on my Linux machine, I was a uh, four times faster. And on my Windows, it was three times. So every, every platform benefited. So that's, that was a good first step. Next, the second part is related to the test. So we did first the build. We did deploy the build, and we did a full weekly release with that new build X bake. So the idea was one pull request. We didn't want big bank changes. First, one main major change, then one weekly release, and then we can iterate. So after the, the first successful weekly release using build X, so we kept the same images, no more feature, only changing the way we built no functional changes. Then the next step was related to the test step. So the test step was almost 13 to 15 minutes at least for each image, even sometimes slower when the build was picking a machine with a, that was already used with no cache or uh, with low power, depending on AWS or Azure hypervisors. And we saw by reading the test different things. First, we were using an unmaintained version of BAT, the shell framework. So we had to switch from the, the original project to the new maintained project. That's the initial author of BAT say, OK, I give that to the community, and we, they switch uh, locations. So we updated BAT. And while updating BAT, we discovered that BAT is now able to parallelize the test with a flag, you can parallelize per test file or per single test. So we said, oh, initially we wanted to at least run, uh, optimize the shell script so that instead of iterating sequentially on each test, we wanted to initially say, okay, let's run all the files uh, in background and then the shell script should wait. But with that flag, BATS can, can do that for us. The only requirement was using GNU parallel. So we had to install this on all the build agents. That's the only requirement. And we have tuned the make file. If you don't have that binary, it's just uh, all the tests will be run sequentially on your machine. If you don't have parallel, it's automatically detected. Otherwise, it will run two tests per virtual CPU on the Docker engine machine. So it's a kind of automatic, and you can disable that with a variable if you see issues, because maybe we there are side effects that we don't code earlier. So if any contributor or CI maintainer see that, there is a variable to disable the parallel testing. So the consequence on the test is that almost all the tests started to fail because we had a lot of tests with duplicated logic or tests that depended on each other on a given file. That was for reasons. This is how the test harness was designed initially a few years ago. 
So after a discussion with a, a few members, it looked like that, in fact, there were no reason to keep the sequential because most of the time, the sequentiality come from a test was building a custom image. So it's say, okay, I have to test Jenkins slash Jenkins LTS Alpine that has just built on the, with BuildX before. And then I have to ensure that I can build that image, but it was already done. Then it was customizing and building a new image from that image with some specific test content and then running a container, eventually two. But each of these tests has the same pattern. So we said, okay, first, we don't need to ensure that the test has to rebuild the image. What we did is that instead of having one machine where we build all the, all the images and then another machine where we test and rebuild all the images, we shift it and said, we have one machine for one platform, let's say Jenkins uh, for Alpine with GDK8. And on the same machine, Docker BuildX was only building Alpine and then run in parallel all the test harness. So just stop building from scratch again during the test phase allowed us to gain two to three minutes per test, per test on 80% of the test. So we went to 30 minutes to six. And then by revamping the test and ensuring they were all independent from each other, so that was a bunch of shell script to do, um, and we cleaned up some tests that were making no sense in the sense that they were written, they were making sense when the author wrote them a few years ago, but now they were duplicating logic or, or even testing nothing. So we removed these tests. That means we had to remove 20% of the tests that were unused, false positive or uh, not optimized. And then we cleaned up the rest. And so now the test phase for a given image depending on the image, is between one and two minutes and a half instead of the initial 15 minutes. So that was quite a huge improvement. If you disable the parallel testing, it was, it, it run around six minutes. And finally, an additional benefit that was quite an issue, and this, that was the reason why the tests were not run in parallel before, with shell script, you were able to completely um, exhaust the resources in the machine. If you, if you throw a bunch of uncontrolled tasks that are quite heavy on CPU mainly, then the CPU start to be over allocated. And we saw the consequences that some agents were cutting the connection to our Jenkins controller. And if you have a Mac Intel, you know what happened. It tried to fly basically with the fan. Uh, with BATS and the parallel testing, it's able to control the allocation of the resources and to, to manage the pool of tests, mainly based on the amount of CPU, which means you don't need to, uh, to risk any resource exhaustion. Everything is managed with your kernel. And so there is no uh, MacBook Pro or laptop trying to run and no more disconnection of the agent. So stabilized pipelines. So yeah, with the combination of these two, we had to revamp most of the make file. So there might be some side effects. We saw some contributors seeing issues that we tried to fix on the go. There might be still some. So if you want to contribute and see issues with make file, don't hesitate to open an issue because we might have broken something. I'm not a machine. Uh, however, most of the heavy lifting on the make file now is how to retrieve the name of a given image from the Docker build X bake result and pass that image as a parameter to the test. So the test can reuse the correct image. That was the most complicated part that involved um, exporting the Docker build X bake configuration as JSON on the study out and parsing that. But outside this, that was quite easy. And we are really happy with what we learned and the results because the time for the Linux images went to Build and test were at 20 to 25 minutes. We are under four minutes now for the combination of both. So that's quite an improvement. Uh, five times faster, let's say. Um, 
Now the next step will be same for Windows. Uh, we're not sure about the strategy and any contributor help is welcome. Uh, Windows is building and testing sequentially for now. So we have to wait um, and find a way. We saw two roads that could be possible from here. The first one is a naive optimization using PowerShell scripting. It's already a PowerShell iterating. So trying to parallelize where PowerShell is way more powerful than Shell in the ability to control parallel resources in background, provide more features. So that could be a first, first step, but we, are, we need contributor at ease with PowerShell scripting. The second roads will be trying to run bats on Windows because now Windows between Sigwin, Git Bash, and the new WSL system should be able uh, to use Docker Windows container built and tested from a bash command line. So maybe we could directly benefit some from, from the rest of the work. However, Docker BuildX is not ready to support Windows platform right now. So yeah, that's the state. We need to spend more time experimenting on that part. But there are some time that we could gain from here because now the Windows part is the slowest. That's all. I don't know if you have question. What an amazing result! Thank you, Damien. That is absolutely exceptional. So, so yeah, I I, I am delighted with the the results. Um, one of the questions for me is okay. This was for the controller. We've also got inbound agent, outbound agent, and agent images. And I believe we've got Jenkins infra images. Do you have an insight there? Are we considering making the change on those or does it not make sense to make the change on the agent build process? Yes, for the Jenkins infra, where we have a collection of images, we are going to apply that change. Um, however, uh, regarding the Jenkins inbound and outbound agents, we will have to discuss that with the community because Jenkins Infra is something that we use for our own use case. So we can experiment and we have a bunch and we will have some the same, let's say a speed improvement for sure, given that we have a collection of images. In the case of inbound, outbound, I don't know, um, that has to be asked. Uh, do we want to move all the images in the same repository because there are dependency between each other? The goal is between a change on the base image and when the change is uh, released and deployed on Docker Hub and available to end users, what are the steps and how much time do we have? And here, the, that need to be like, mapped and then see if we can optimize this. Okay, I hadn't considered that. So there is an, there is an attribute of that, that today's situation with three separate GitHub repositories, one for the base agent, one for inbound agent, and one for outbound agent might be better suited by Docker build X bake in a single repository. I think that's what you're saying, but, but then we've got to deal with the different tag tagging patterns or naming patterns in each of those subsets. So there's a, a, a interesting. Okay. Thank you. Great. That is amazing. Thank you very much. Great summary. I'm, I'm likely to put a link to this recording into places, and I assume that we'll eventually do a blog post sharing this because I think the results are already amazing. Thank you. Any, hey, thanks. I don't have any other questions. Anything else you'd like to share or highlight for us on, on results you've seen or what you see as next steps? So the next step is mainly handled by team uh, Yacom right now. Uh, it will be regarding the um, uh, building and providing other architecture uh, for Jenkins, oh, so IRM, oh, or PC, etc. That's right. And that, that actually, okay, so multi-architecture, and, and that's, that's really quite a cool story. So I've got to share that. I've got to show that. So on the Jenkins roadmap, we have had on the roadmap for an extended period that we would support Docker images for System 390, mainframe for PowerPC and for ARM. And thanks to this work on BuildX Bake and further 
we've got progress on that, right? So Damien, why don't you share more what, what mm -hmm. you're seeing there? So that's also a benefit of using Docker BuildX. So Docker BuildX by default is a standalone replacement to the default Docker build command, which is you have a binary Docker, which is a Docker client, and you have a Docker engine, which run on your local machine on uh, Linux or inside the virtual machine on Docker desktop for Windows or Mac OS, which is a Linux or Windows machine. And sometimes you have a remote Docker engine. So Docker build is a way to build uh, a Docker file, which is on your client side. It sends the Docker file and the context of the Docker file on the remote machine, Docker engine, and it's able to build the image. That was the Docker build goal. With buildx, first, uh, the art, art, um, artifact output is not only a Docker image, it can be a tar GZ on your local file system, which means send Docker file to remote Docker engine, build the image, and retrieve a tar gz image instead of storing that on the remote Docker engine. That one is useful when you need to, to use air gap system or when you need to export a Docker image to the OCI standard compliance. So you will have an archive which is OCI and that can be loaded on any Creo or any container engine somewhere else. So not only, uh, not only you have this kind of benefits, but also BuildX introduced the concept of a worker. A worker is a, a daemon running on the Docker engine where you want to build or any container engine you want to use. And it allows you to build container without needing root uh, access to the remote machine. It can run on remote machine with a different architecture. It can even build container inside a remote Kubernetes cluster because it's a daemon, that means I, it spawn a Docker engine and then it goes. Oh, excuse me, just a minute. Sorry, I'm back. So with the concept of, the, of a worker, that means that a local Docker client is able to send things on a bunch of remote BuildX workers, which can be a remote Kubernetes cluster. And so that means a single Docker BuildX command is able to, to send builds requests to different machines. So one ARM, one Intel, one uh, PowerPC. So as soon as you have a collection of remote Docker BuildX daemon. If my, I, I'm not completely sure about the wording, the documentation is way more clearer than me, but the idea is that you have one Docker file, one Docker client, and you have a bunch of remote machine. BuildX allows to, to, to manage that cluster. And so with that in, a, in account, Docker added a nice feature, which is enabling KEMU, the emulator, so BuildX is able to spawn a on a local Docker engine, Docker, Linux, Mac, Windows, with an Intel machine or IRM machine. And it starts and enable KEMU emulation. And it's able to run Docker engine with images for different architecture. That technology exists since two years on Docker desktop for Mac. It was featured on different Docker code, like, oh, you can run Raspberry Pi Docker image on your, on your Mac OS instead of a slow Raspberry Pi. So using that feature, Docker BuildX is able to spawn in five, six seconds with KEMU, a worker which is able to build in parallel for all the supported architecture here. So what did team uh, work? He only added the supported and expected architectures on the Docker bake file, saying, okay, we want for Jenkins, Debian, not only Intel, but also IRM, etc. So that was just an array to, to append. And we had to install KEMU, and I'm sure it's enabled on all the agents. And if you have both, so enabling KEMU is quite easy. It's a Docker container to run with the privilege that will enable an instruction on the kernel, and then that's okay. And with, and with the bake change and the KEMU emulation, 
then we are able with a single docker build x bake command to build in parallel a given image on different architecture at the same time on an Intel machine. We don't need specific architectural machine. Just, just a minute. Sorry, it's, it's the war here. <laughs> Too much person at home, sorry. Um, so with that in mind, sorry again. Okay, sorry. Uh, so with KMU installed and the bake change, it allowed us to build successfully during one week on CI Jenkins IO all these architecture images without requiring any specific uh, architecture agent, which is quite a good step. So it's an emulator. So maybe one day we will find issues because we built an image with some binary built or whatever, but most of the time we only download um, binaries and packages for a given architecture and we rely on the upstream operating system, Debian packages, Alpine packages, CentOS packaging. So we don't compile on our own, so we should not have any issue. So with that in mind, now the work is to be able to publish these images first as experimental. So translating our work from CI to trusted, so from the CI parts to the where we publish officially and sign the images. So we had some hiccups on that second part. Uh, we discover why it's because depending on the cloud provider and the kind of hypervisor using the, the virtual machine we use to Docker build, sometimes you only have to enable KMU one time when building the custom virtual machine templates, and then it will be enabled um, always. And then some other cloud provider or hypervisor you need to re-enable KMU before each build. So we decided that the pipeline had to be updated to force updating KMU because it's idempotent. So if you run the Docker run, blah, 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 privilege KMU enable in any image, you can run it one, 10 times. It will have the same result on the end. So we run it before the build and it's okay. So that was the last uh, changes and fixes that are quite hot because it was this morning in Europe. So thanks for team for all the effort and the heavy lifting here. Uh, that's, that's really interesting to see the, our ability to go forward on that subject. So anyone interested on that part, don't hesitate to raise your hand, propose help or reach out on this course. Same if you Thank have any you. question. That is Thanks it. very much, Damien. That's excellent. I I don't have any further questions, although I admit I am looking forward to having an ARM image. Um, I'm a little jazzed about System 390 and PowerPC just because they're so exotic to me. So thank you very much. That's great. Now, I assume no plan for ARM32, for instance, that this is all 64-bit work. Uh, I don't know what were the decision. Um, yeah, yeah the we, well, of, I guess I guess uh, that's a good point. We we had long ago chosen. I guess it's a year or two ago chosen that officially the Jenkins project is actually only running on sixty four bit JVM. So I've answered my own question. Really, we don't support. Yes, it runs on thirty two bit virtual machines, but fundamentally the project does not test Windows thirty two bit, for instance, and we certainly hmm. don't test any Linux thirty two bit. And, and so no reason for us to make an exception here. It's all 64-bit all the time. Yeah, unless there is a real use case, like at large scale, but yeah, most of the ARM provider now provide a 64 ARM architecture, especially in ARM. I remember that 32 bits, uh, there were a bunch of different variations, Raspberry Pis, uh, depending on the uh, serial right. number were having different CPU architecture that was kind of nightmare. And since the Raspberry Pi 3, which is now four year old at least, uh, yeah, we have that one. I don't know for other amateur or professional platform, but most of the IRM cloud provider are 64, so that makes sense. 
great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else you wanted to share today? I know that's already a lot. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much. That covers all the okay. topics we had for today. Any other topics we should bring to our agenda today? Um, given the, the amount of work I've added, I wanted to write a mail. Uh, I will still have. Uh, I'm not a maintainer of the image, and I will want to volunteer to be part of the maintenance team, especially given the amount of code I changed there. Um, so I suppose it's a request to the community that has to go through email and yeah, just I don't just know send a, so I I asked to become a volunteer, uh, maintain the Docker images so you can find uh, that was a while ago. Uh, so you can find an example. I think it just sends to Jenkins developers. I will immediately plus one that. I am confident that Tim Jacom will give his immediate vote yes, and and then you'll be granted permission. Thanks. All right. We'll end our meeting now then. Thanks everybody. Recording will be posted um, shortly. So within 24 hours. Thanks all. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.